welcome to section 2.22, the Kelvin cycle, and then after that we'll briefly do just a photosynthesis review, uh, which a summary of photosynthesis is all 2.23 is. So we'll take care of that one uh, really quick at the end. So I want you guys just starting off to look at this general chart. This is the Kelvin cycle. Uh, so you'll see this process here is a cycle. It's going to be cyclical. It's going to go around and around, and I'll explain more about that later. But I also just want you guys to realize how complicated it is. Now, we're not going to go through and try and memorize all the various steps that are part of this. We're just going to try to make sure as a whole that you understand kind of what the purpose of this process is, uh, what it does for a plant, why plants need to do it, what it needs to function. But I want you guys just to appreciate that a lot of these things we talk about in regular biology, which we simplify, are in reality in your body a whole series of, in some cases, 10 or 20 different reactions that are all working together. So it's a bit more like when you push down the dominoes and watch them all fall, and at the end it might do something. But there's a lot of steps in between the start and the end. So we're going to continue to kind of ignore most of those steps, but I want you guys to appreciate it. So starting off, what do we need? What are we going to get? So for us to do carbon fixation, which is really what the Kelvin cycle is about, it's trying to take CO2 gas, carbon dioxide, and it's trying to basically affix that to other molecules so it's now part of a bigger molecule. We call that carbon fixation. So specifically, it's going to attach it to a guy called RUBP. Uh, that's uh, ribulose biphosphate is the fancy word that you won't need to really know. Uh, and the enzyme Rubisco is the one that actually does this. So it's probably the most common enzyme in the world. So plants have this, and it just allows them to stick ACO2 to a single RUBP. So that's the start of this process of the Kelvin cycle. Now the purpose for this is for every three CO2s that we bring in to start this process, we end up with these three extra carbons that get stuck together at the end. And they get stuck together into this three carbon molecule called G3P. So this will be composed of three carbons. So this is a very simple sugar. It's essentially half of a glucose. And so this G3P is the actual end product of photosynthesis. If we take two of these together and we attach them, we do get glucose. So we commonly refer to the fact that photosynthesis makes glucose. But that's just the most common end product. That's the most common thing we produce at the end that we actually use as a plant, if you're a plant. Uh, but ultimately, what it produces realistically, if we're being honest here, is actually half a glucose or a G3P. The other cool thing is at the end, it regenerates the three RUBP it started with. So these three CO2s essentially become the G3P, and the rest of the materials, the other RUBPs, they get regenerated, they get rebuilt. And so that means there's this cycle here. That's why this is called the Kelvin cycle, because I start with RUBP and I end with RUBP, so I'm ready to start again. I'm ready to attach more CO2s and continue the process. This is going to take place in the stroma of the chloroplast. So if you remember, there was those outer membranes, which I will draw badly here for you. And then there were those thylakoids, and we said all the rest of that space, you know, the, the cytoplasm essentially, and the very inner part, that's the stroma. So when you're looking at this, that's where this is taking place, essentially the cytoplasm of the chloroplast. Now, for us to do carbon fixation, for us to do this building of G3P, it is going to require energy. And so for us to do this process, we're going to take the ATP and the NADPH that we produce during the light reactions to give us the energy needed to attach CO2s to RUBP, to go through and ultimately produce G3P by attaching uh, some of the molecules we're making kind of together, if you will. Because the end result is, it's not exactly how it happens, but it's the equivalent of taking those three CO2s and sticking them to each other with a couple hydrogens mixed in there to make it a sugar. And so that's kind of the overall end result if you think of it in your mind, even though in reality it's like 20 way more complicated steps. And so you can see that here where these three CO2s are needed, and you can think of them very roughly, I'm not saying this perfectly accurately, but it's good enough for us, is the three CO2s will essentially turn into one G3P. Notice three carbons, so it's all matched up. So that takes care of our CO2, that's its job. And for us to go through and build anything, it takes energy. So, and you don't need to know the numbers, but it will take nine ATP and, and ultimately it takes six NADPH to do this. And so that's why we have to do the light reactions. Without the light reactions, we don't have the energy for this to occur. The other idea I want you to get is there's lots of cycles going on. We've already talked about the RUBP is being recycled, so that's gonna continue in a cycle. 
The ATP you can see is broken down into ADP, diphosphate, and it, what they call an inorganic phosphate, just a phosphate by its lonesome. And these guys will then be rebuilt during the light reactions, so I draw this, to become ATP again. Just like NADPH is going to be busted apart into NADP+, which, after we split water, which gives us H pluses and electrons, can also, by the light reactions, be rebuilt into NADPH. So most of the stuff that we're doing in photosynthesis is really part of a cycle. Whether it's a building and destroying ATP cycle, whether it's a building and destroying NADPH cycle, or whether it's a building, manipulating, and then rebuilding RUBP cycle, all these things for the most part are cycles. The only guys that really aren't part of a cycle, in photosynthesis at least, is these CO2s. But even they, if you include cell respiration, cell respiration takes sugars, such as G3P essentially, and breaks it back down into CO2, which plants then take the CO2 and reattach it to make sugars. So even that's part of a bigger cycle that we have going on that involves cell respiration and photosynthesis both working together to kind of break down and build stuff up. So a lot of these things that we talk about in biology will function on these cycles. And so I don't want you guys to forget that. Now, one of the more interesting things about the Kelvin cycle and photosynthesis in general is we need CO2. And plants have these pores, that's what you see here, this is open, this one's closed, these pores that are typically on the underside of their leaves. And it allows, by opening up, by these two cells kind of swelling to come apart, it allows CO2 to get in. But there's a problem. If CO2 can get in, water can get out. And so plants have issues then where if it gets too dry, they're losing so much water, they have to close them up. And if they close them up, like this guy in the bottom, the problem is then they don't get enough CO2 in to do photosynthesis. It's actually even worse than that because not having CO2 can make another process called photorespiration occur, and that one's actually negative for the plant. So it doesn't just you know like squander stuff, it actually is harmful to the plant. So plants have this huge dilemma where they've got to decide, do I want CO2 so I can do photosynthesis? Or if it's dry out, am I going to die from lack of water? And so that's kind of this rock in a hard place idea. Now, the average plant that just kind of doesn't care, you know, this is like the guy that just gets in his car and floors it and doesn't really worry about resource usage. That's a C3 plant. So C3 plants, for the most part, just leave their stomata open as much as possible. They do as much photosynthesis as possible, and they lose the most water. So these guys will do the most photosynthesis. I'll just write most photo because i got limited space. Uh, but in the process, they're going to use the most water. And so that's a problem. These are the first guys to die if there's a drought because they squander their water the fastest. So imagine if you're making a bunch of money and you're spending the money really fast. If suddenly you start to dry up your income, so you're not making as much money, you run out of money really fast if you keep spending it rapidly. That's C3 plants. So these are like grasses, so they do very well as long as it's consistently wet. Then next we've got C4 plants, which do quite a bit of photosynthesis. They're kind of the mid guy, so they do an okay amount of photosynthesis, not quite as much as C3, but pretty good. And they use a pretty decent amount of water, but not as much as the C4 plants. So we'll just kind of leave them blank because they're kind of the middle guy. You know, So these are a lot like weeds, where they do well if there's periodic droughts, but ones that don't last indefinitely. You know, It might get dry for a couple weeks, and so they tend to do a better job of, they actually can store the CO2 a little bit, and they, the way that their leaves are arranged, it lets them concentrate the CO2 better. And so for them, they can cope better while closing their stomata, but they still like to keep them open. So it's more like imagine if you were a person that can come out of the sun during the hottest part of the day for a while each day, versus C3 plants are always in the sun. You know, they're always like a person that's just out there saying, I'm going to work nonstop no matter what. It's better, but it's still not great. If you have an area like a desert where it's consistently dry, they still aren't very good. And that brings us to cam plants, which are going to be succulents like cacti. So this is a cam plant. And these guys don't even open their stomata during the day. They keep them closed. They store CO2 in their cells at night. And that means that they waste almost no water. So their water usage is ridiculously low. They also minimize things by typically not having leaves or very fat leaves to minimize surface area. They do everything they can to conserve water. That's why many of them have needles, because otherwise organisms come and try to take their water. Uh, but the downside of this is they do photosynthesis the slowest. 
And so this is why you don't see in a, a lush area like a rainforest, you won't typically see cacti or succulents because they get outcompeted by C3 or C4 plants in those conditions. They really thrive in the conditions where the other guys die. Because even though they're slow, slow and steady wins the race if the other guys are dead. Not that difficult. Now, just a quick review then. So the overall equation that we've dealt with is we need 6 CO2, or just CO2 in general. This is needed for the Kelvin cycle. We needed water, six waters in this case, if we're being accurate. And this one's going to be needed from the light reactions. So Kelvin cycle light reactions, if I can make that look more like an L. We're going to need light, and that's also going to be for the light reactions. And our end product, which really this is lying, it's actually going to be more like a C3H6O3, uh, G3P. But we're going to commonly use glucose, which is just going to be two G3Ps, as our sample end product, because that's the most common thing that's made by photosynthesis after it's finished. It just sticks two G3Ps together. Keep in mind this G3P can also become other stuff. It can become proteins, lipids. Uh, we're not trying to say that it has to always make any one specific thing. It always makes G3P, but after that the G3P can be modified to be anything else. The most common thing it's modified into, of course, is glucose, so we'll commonly use that here. And then where you have the oxygen, which came from splitting water, so that technically comes over and down here. So H2O is what splitting gives us O2, and this is what we breathe as animals that makes us happy. And you can see down here, it's showing the same thing. H2O is going to light reactions, O2 is coming out, light's going into light reactions, and then the purpose of the light reactions is to make NADPH and ATP, which are energy molecules, which are needed by the Calvin cycle to allow us to take CO2 and ultimately convert it to be a sugar which we know, depending on how you're talking about it, will be either G3P or glucose, uh, depending on who you're talking to and what exactly they're trying to focus on. If they're focusing on the very, very end or if they're fo focusing on just at the very end of the Kelvin cycle, but not kind of after you've messed with the G3P. That's it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll pick up with chemosynthesis later.